Okay, visionary creativity, week 10. Um, we're now going to talk about how you become a visionary creator. So <clears throat> let me start by saying that in this course, I'm not talking about creativity. Creativity is BS. Everybody's creative. You can find a dozen books about how we're all creative. And what are we told about children and creativity? Children and art. All children are great artists, and school beats it out of them. <laughs> um, so it, we're going to talk instead about visionary creativity. And visionary creativity is a little more heavy duty. It's more taking on one's culture and changing it. And that isn't always welcome by the society. So we'll talk about that this week and this, next week. And, <clears throat> you know, we all follow threads of what interests us. Uh, you're going to encounter a couple of teachers in school that really resonate for you. And you're lucky if they're one or two or three out of all the ones you'll run into. Um, I was really lucky. I was at a an amazing school at a great period. It, it just nobody knew it when I got when I entered. But by the time I left, these were the major figures of of the time: architects like Louis Kahn and Edmund Bacon and Robert Venturi. So they've all been with me ever since. I'm right now. <laughs> I did a book on Louis Kahn, and I'm right now doing another one. Um, I just spent um, Friday at the University of Pennsylvania archive getting the photos and drawings and illustrations of my book, etc. So these figures are still with me. And we'll talk about that in, there's a section in my book about that, about teachers. And it, it says, oh, why don't I read it? So I'll just talk about teachers, and next week we'll go into education and all that. But your teachers, real people who are influence you or composites that you create for yourself, you may never find the ideal teacher. And so maybe you put together pieces um, from people you've encountered. Bring to you an objectivity and clarity that you initially do not have. So you might make something and think it's the greatest thing ever, and then the teacher starts taking it apart. Now, hopefully, the teacher takes it apart in a constructive way. Um, in school, you bring your work to the studio. Bring it off to the studio. Your classmates admire it. Your teacher works with you. Take it apart. Analyze your intentions. Identify your strategies. Find weaknesses. And help you move forward with a deeper understanding. Then you enter your discipline. You're no longer with your teacher. But you can still hear their voices. <clears throat> People have influenced me. Some of them have been in books, so there's no voice. The ones that I've heard lecture or where people had classes with, when I read them, when I think about what they're saying, I can actually hear their voices. Eventually that fades and you hear your own voice. You take your work apart, analyze your intentions, identify your strategies, find weaknesses, and move forward with a deeper understanding on your own. So, one of these people for me is a mythologist one of these people for me is the mythologist Joseph Campbell. And I was fortunate for about 10 years after he retired from teaching at Sarah Lawrence, he lectured uh, 
basic, roughly every couple months, give a series of uh, three or four lectures in New York. <clears throat> and I went to all of them. And uh, it, I was really, it just blew me away. I was looking around and said, why isn't everybody here? <laughs> Does anybody know about this? And um, he had been a bestseller 20 years earlier with his uh, first major book, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And then just after he died, he became mega famous. He was interviewed by Roy Moyers for public television in a six-part series. And it was one of the biggest audiences ever on public television. He became mega famous, but he didn't get to enjoy it. He quoted this from Nietzsche, this uh, parable. So it sort of got in the back of my mind. And then when I was working on this book on creativity, I said, you know what? This is where it applies. Nietzsche's not talking about this is what we should all do. He's saying this is what visionary creatives should do because this is rough stuff. So <clears throat> the three metamorphoses of the spirit and it's from Thus Spoke the Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, late 19th century German philosopher. And he's one of the precursors of existentialism. And existentialism is um, it's tricky to define, but pretty much we could say, OK, we exist. How should we handle that? <laughs> So existentialism is the study of existence. Uh, what does that mean? And again, it comes up in the late 19th, early 20th century, because that's when Western Europeans are saying, how do we approach these issues without reference to God or the Bible? Although one of the existentialists, Kierkegaard, is uh, uh, Christian. But in general, it's trying to think these things through uh, without religion. So in this parable begins, Nietzsche says, of the three metamorphoses, okay, what does metamorphosis mean? Very good. Change of shape. Of the three metaphors, of the three metaphor, of the three metamorphoses of the spirit, I tell you, how the spirit becomes a camel, and the camel a lion, and the lion finally a child. Who did these illustrations? Right. I happened to find a Leonardo da Vinci for each one. <laughs> So, what is difficult, asks the spirit, that would, be, that would bear much, and kneels down like a camel waiting to be well loaded. So the camel says, put a load on me. <laughs> and the load is mastering your discipline. Now, unfortunately, that includes mastering your culture as well. So, becoming literate, familiar with your culture, familiar with your discipline in terms of theory and also the practice of your discipline, the techniques. The whole thing. <clears throat> uh, hopefully, <clears throat> four years at Pratt gives you some of that. That's presumably the idea. There's a lot of discussion about American education and how bad it is. Fortunately, we've escaped that because this is not a liberal arts school. You're not spending four years and $250,000 
to be exposed to some amorphous liberal arts opinions. You're mastering a discipline. So that's one of the things I appreciate about Pratt. <clears throat> Hopefully you're exposed to literature, to science, etc., but um, you also are mastering a discipline. And maybe I like to think if your discipline is presented well, you are studying your culture through your discipline. Certainly the way we try to look at architecture in the architecture school of Pratt is architecture is a manifestation of a culture in form. So what we're making is a crystallization of the culture. So you are plugged into the culture to be able to make your architecture. So in, early on in the debate about American education, there's a book by Copperman called The Literacy Hoax, long out of print but available to use. And Copperman says there are three kinds of literacy, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary literacy is the ability to read and write. And today we say read and write and compute. Although I don't think they know how to teach math. Uh, I took calculus. And, Whoa, what does that have to do with anything? But anyway, um, and you can generalize that. <clears throat> In your discipline, you know, what are the basic skills? So whatever they may be, the equivalent of reading, writing, and computing. Secondary literacy is mastering the literature of your culture, knowing the key works, the key ideas, knowing what human culture has been about, what um, 20th century cultures are about, the cultures we live in today. Tertiary literacy is the ability to apply the first two to your discipline and your life. In other words, how can you make your life richer by having read Russian novels, by having seen the great movies, by whatever? And how can you be a better designer, filmmaker, whatever you are, because you know the great literature? and you know the basic techniques. So that's the camel. And it simply means a good education. Now, the whole little section in my book about what's an education. <clears throat> and what I say is, maybe I like to think of education that we get in school like a trellis, a framework. Imagine a garden and you have this trellis who does not know what a trellis is? Okay, it's sort of interwoven thin slats of wood that might make something you walk under or a wall and vines grow in. So the trellis is the framework. I like to draw a diagram for my students and I say, Egypt, Greece, Rome, Gothic, Renaissance, Location, dates, key buildings, key architects. You, sh you should know that in first year. Now, 10, I, I, I always give the Gothic lecture, <clears throat> and I do Chartres Cathedral. I like to say, you know one Gothic cathedral, you know them all. Now, if you're into Gothic architecture, that's, you don't want to hear that. There are beautiful cathedrals, and there's lots of different ones. But for the purpose of the trellis, that's the basics. When you go to France and you travel and you look at these cathedrals, you'll see the rest. And you will know where to fit them. That's, that's the vines growing into your trellis. As you visit Rome, you visit Greece, you... Um, read uh, the stones of Venice, 
by Ruskin. Uh, you'll know where to put that greater depth, that vines, because you've got the overall trellis from your education. So your education doesn't have to give you all the details, but it should give you a way to know where to put stuff that you encounter as you go forward. <clears throat> and I'm in favor of kind of a, uh, an education which is very structured in the beginning and is all electives at the end. Uh, and the structure at the beginning gives you the framework that the electives at the end, you'll know where to put that stuff. It won't just be random facts that you're accumulating, but rather you're building something substantial for yourself. Okay. The camel then runs out into the desert. In the loneliest desert, however, the second metamorph metamorphosis occurs. Here the spirit becomes a lion who would conquer his freedom and be master in his own desert. Now, and then Nietzsche says, if the camel was well loaded, it becomes a potent lion. So you have to be a well-loaded camel to become a potent lion. We'll see why a potent lion. And it says here, who would conquer his freedom? And it's a little tricky. What does that mean? Does that mean win his freedom to become free or mean overcome his freedom? And at this point, maybe we need to know a little more about Nietzsche. What does anybody know besides God is dead the other phrase Nietzsche is associated with? The will to power. Now, that's a tricky phrase because it can be the Nazis like Nietzsche and they adopted that phrase and you can interpret it to mean that one should exert one's power. Nietzsche doesn't always mean it that way. Sometimes he does. What he mostly means is, first of all, what am I all about? What do I want to do with my life? I felt like when I read this, he was working on like the idea of agency, like personal agency. Right. I want to project my John Lobelness. I want to find out who I am and put it out there. So it's writing books, going around the country lecturing. Why don't I get more lectures? Um, I wrote a book years ago and I lectured at a quarter of all the architecture schools in that country. They haven't had me back, that's why I gotta write another book. Um, so when you write a book, you get on the lecture tour. So um, yeah. Is it about putting your work out there or is it just about like you know the aerosol and flourishing? It can probably be either in terms of who you want to be. In other words, suppose you want to be a responsible and nurturing parent. So it's not putting anything out there. It's, you said agency, it's assuming your, I'll avoid the word power, and say assuming your ability to take on that role and then exercising it diligently and successfully. If you want to be creative, you want to be visionary creative, then you got to put something out there. But I don't think everybody should be visionary creative. Maybe everybody should be creative, and that's why I think the word's meaningless. You know, if we're all creative, then it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's like saying, 
unless you've had an unfortunate accident. We all have two eyes. Okay. Uh, we're all creative. But visionary creative means you're taking on a whole way of being in the world. And toward the end of my book, I say <clears throat> there are different types. Now, there are different ways that psychology identifies types, personality types. Assertive, passive, etc. But I do it where I say there are creatives, producers, actives, um, makers. There are people who just love to go into the shop and make stuff. You know, and after school, particularly men do this, they're going to have a workshop out in the garage and they'll have these tools, you know, with a drill press and, a, and they'll make shelves and they'll make end tables and always making something. Um, actives, I became aware of. My parents had friends who had a kid. And this kid hung out with his buddies and they'd go out cruising in their car. And then there was a draft then, and so they get drafted into the military. And he says, cool. You know, that's active. But then they discover, and this is the 1960s, that this guy is a natural with computers. <laughs> so now he's stuck at a desk <laughs> doing computer stuff. He gets out of the military. He becomes a cop. He wants to be out with his buddies in the car, now patrolling. He just wants to be out there, you know, doing, being active. And then the, the police force gets a computer and discover that he's a computer whiz. Now he's stuck at a desk again. again. <laughs> so you usually think, oh, patrolmen in a uniform, that's the lower job. They all want to move up to be detective. No. A lot of them don't. They don't want to be sitting behind a desk. They want to be outside moving around. There are people who are like that. And the ultimate expression of that is special forces. Um, these are, they're called Olympic athletes with guns. You know, whether it's climbing mountains or whatever that needs to be done. And then when they get out of the military, it's rough. And a lot of them become smoke jumpers. And then they have these wildfires in California that want to jump out of the airplanes and behind the fire lines to fight the fires. They just got to be active. Well, that's a, you know, we wouldn't expect them to be visionary creatives. They're actives. It's a different personality type. And I think we, the best thing each of us can do is identify what we are and not try to be forced, like one of the types is a scholar. There are people who are mystics. They want to meditate. They want to experience higher realms of consciousness. And if somebody says they enter higher realms of consciousness and you don't, don't feel put down that you're not that type. I think they're all valid. And visionary creatives are a certain type. And not all of us are going to be that. If the camel is well loaded, he becomes a lion, and it's a potent lion. And the job of a lion is to slay a dragon. For ultimate victory, he wants to fight with the great dragon. Thou shalt is the name of the great dragon. But the spirit of the lion says, I will. The dragon is the culture, the tradition. This is what you're supposed to do. Yes, in the biblical sense. But for our purposes, this is how you do fashion. This is how you do advertising design layout. This is how you do movie editing, whatever your discipline is. And maybe you're going to be happy doing that. But if you're a visionary creative, you're going to say, that doesn't sound right to me. So here you have these teachers. And if you really get into it, and this won't click for you 
So maybe some years after school. But you have these teachers, and they say this cool stuff, they teach you this cool stuff, you've mastered this cool stuff, and you say, wow, now I got it. And then maybe, now, maybe you're just going to do that, and that's fine, you're going to be happy doing that. But if you get in, if you're a visionary creative, you're going to start to say, you know, there's part of that that doesn't quite make sense. And I see a loose thread. What happens when you pull a loose thread? The whole thing unravels, right. <laughs> oh, maybe, you know. Now, hopefully, there are plenty of pieces that are still going to be there for you. Uh, still going to work. But, you know, you're beginning to see something else. But Nietzsche says, the lion can destroy tradition, but cannot create the new. What can the child do that even the lion could not do? The child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a game, a wheel rolling out of its own center, a first movement, a sacred yes. So only the child can create the new. And then, where does this come from? Okay. Um, what are the ten greatest movies of all time? This is on every list. Okay, this is 2001 A Space Odyssey. And I don't remember the year. Um, but it's the first great science fiction movie. And... I think it was 1968. 68? I think so. Thank you. Most days also? Uh huh. So, um, so let me play you the opening of the movie. I've seen the opening so many times. Oh, how many people have not seen the opening? Right. So, there are two spiritual traditions that spirit comes from within or spirit comes from without. And let's take a 10 minute break for a bathroom break, and et cetera, and then we'll finish up. So, be back at 6.15. Well, he gets there and there's a light show. What happens? Right. Does he encounter them? He's an old he suddenly becomes a very old man and he's in a he's in a um, French uh, um, mansion or something? Well, a French dining room with antique furniture. Why? Um, what are the monoliths? Who put them there? Why? Oh, so that doesn't get solved? Pardon? That doesn't get solved? No. It's just he, he gets to the moon of Mars. There's a big light show, lots of special effects, and then he comes, he becomes this, presumably, he's reborn as the next stage of the human race, the star child. Presumably. We just see that, but nobody tells us that. And I superimpose the satellite for a wheel rolling out of its own center. Now, <clears throat> interesting thought. Um, the movie is saying something I don't necessarily agree with. And that is, there are two spiritual traditions. Spirit comes from within and spirit comes from without. In the biblical tradition, in um, one of the, there's several stories in Genesis. One of them, God creates Adam and Eve in, in as little as ma, in clay. 
and the clay is dead. And God breathes the spirit of life into the dead clay, and it comes to life. So the matter of the earth is dead, spirit comes into it from without. The other tradition is spirit is inherent. Okay, that's the biblical tradition. And that's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In Chinese and Japanese traditions, spirit is in all things. So Isi Shrine is built, they, they don't varnish the wood because it's radiating its spirit. It has to be rebuilt every 20 years because it's going to rot because you don't varnish it. So, is spirit inherently in all things, or does spirit come from without, from the creator? Two different traditions. This is saying, we're not smart enough to become modern human beings on our own. We needed the intervention of a galactic intelligence, which is seeding intelligence in various planets, and ours was one of the ones they chose. We couldn't have done it on our own. So it's, even though it's not explicitly stated, it's, um, it's there. So it's taking a position about these two spiritual traditions. Okay, um, so mastery before creativity, the camel. And here are some creative figures. And if we look at major creative figures that we admire, think about the ones you admire, see if the model fits. Each one of these, Beethoven, mastered the Viennese <clears throat> symphony before launching Romanticism. So early Beethoven, I'm not into music, so, uh, but I hear early Beethoven, it's, eh, you know, is that Mozart or Beethoven? The early Beethoven is really the Mozart Haydn, he's composing Mozart Haydn type Viennese symphonies. Then he breaks away from that to destroy that. That was last week. We talked about destruction. To destroy that and launch a new musical movement, Romanticism. So, um, see if I can get my laser back. Picasso went to the academy, mastered classical painting, dropped out, and then began to revolutionize art. But he had mastered traditional academic painting before doing that. Thelonious Monk worked with the jazz greats in the creation of bebop, and then entered his own world. Robert Venturi, one of my teachers, understood the modernism he attacked better than did his critics. So if we look at creative people we admire, I, I'm a big advocate, much more important than books on creativity or biographies. And um, a good biography, a good artistic biography that chronicles not only the life but the work of the figure is a really good learning and inspiration for us. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I'm in the middle of, a, I hardly read anymore, but fortunately it was on audio books. I'm in the middle of a massive biography of Picasso by Arianna Huffington, who's a, now a political figure 
she, uh, Huffington Post uh, online news site is hers. But before doing that, she wrote a few books, one on Pop Picasso, and it's a fantastic book. And I happen to have this monster catalog uh, from a big MoMA show that has this whole career. <clears throat> so when she refers to stuff, I can look in the book, you know. Now he dropped this mistress and got that mistress and started doing portraits of her. <laughs> you can find them in the book. Uh, so, um, seeing how these people put their lives together, their creative lives, I find very interesting. Now we hear the term critical thinking. And I think it's a real BS term. You'll hear it at Pratt a lot. Uh, all the liberal arts courses claim they're teaching critical thinking. Uh, they're critical of the disciplines if they're not being critical. Critical thinking about what? There's no such thing as critical thinking without mastering a subject. You know, you have to know something to be critical of it. So, um, education was, has been, since the 1930s, moving away from mastering a body of material and moving toward uh, indoctrination on politically correct points of view, which they call critical thinking. <clears throat> In an attack on that, a series of books came out in the 80s, and one of them by E.D. Hirsch, Cultural Literacy. And he argued you can't critically think about something unless you know it. And schools aren't teaching anything anymore. So, you know, they ask uh, various comedians go out, late night show comedians go out in the street, and they say, what are the three branches of government? You know, Huey, Dewey, and Louie? Uh, you know, nobody knows. Nobody learns anything in school anymore. So E.D. Hearst wrote this book, What Every American Needs to Know, uh, Cultural Literacy. And then has written a whole series of books, what your kids should know in the fifth grade, what your kids should know in the sixth grade. So if the school's not going to do it, parents can do it with their kids. Now, just to pick on a certain ethnic group, anybody been to a bookstore in Chinatown? I'm going, I'm, there, there's stores in Chinatown that, that have a whole section of books. And you can tell that these are for people who don't trust the schools. What your kid should know in third grade math. What your kid should know in fourth grade math. What your kid should know in fifth grade math. So these are books for parents to work with their kids to learn the stuff that the schools aren't teaching. And I don't see them in any other neighborhood, but I see them in Chinatown. Uh, I've, a book that I very much appreciated around that time, The Literacy Hoax. And what Copperman did was show that SAT scores have been collapsing. Remember, I, uh, I graduated high school in 59, went to Penn, and a year later I'm on the phone with my mother and she said, the kids a year behind you are the highest scores ever on the SATs. So they were going from the 1930s, they're going up, 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 up. And then about 1970, they started to go down. And what they did was they faked the way they scored to hide that because the educational industry didn't want anybody to know that the whole thing had collapsed. No one was learning anything anymore. So Copperman showed what was going on, and it was a hoax. And it is the idea of primary literacy, which I just described. Primary, secondary, and tertiary literacy. Now around that time, a mega bestseller 
was the closing of the American mind, how higher education has failed democracy and impoverished the souls of today's students. I don't fully agree with Alan Bloom. There's good stuff in the book, but this book is now 30 years old, and it's still um, read and discussed today. He attaches uh, Nietzsche for his relativism. I don't think there's any choice. Uh, I think we're in a relativistic world. If somebody tells me that there's some things that are true, I'll say to them, give me an example. Does anybody believe that certain things are true? Well, I'm a relativist, so <laughs> it's another discussion. We can have it if you want. But um, this book does a good job of pointing it out. It's a good description of Nietzsche's impact on education. He just doesn't like it. Now, um, one of the purposes of education is to prevent you from doing things. Who, who knows about the 27 Club? Oh, yeah. Right. There's like 50 major musicians who died at 27. Anybody here 27? How many, how many people are 22, 23, 24, 25, 20? How old are you guys? 21? Okay, so everybody's 21. So you got six years to go. <laughs> Not before you die, it's just we expect you to create something. Alexander the Great was create, commanding armies for his father when he was 15. Horatio Nelson was commanding sea battles at the age of 12. Uh, you know, I mean, the average lifespan was like 35 until uh, 1900. So you had to get it done. <laughs> you couldn't, you know, today you're not allowed to do anything till you till you're, have your PhD. And that's usually around 30, 32, 35. Uh, so let's see what I have here. Most important thing a school can do is to have a cohesive point of view that helps you form a framework. We talked about that earlier. But that's rare today. Despite this failure, schools have an inordinate influence on our lives far beyond what they should have. For example, to teach musical composition today, one must have a PhD, and that might take till your late 30s. Some would not have made it. Chopin died at 39, Gershwin at 38, Bizet at 37, Mozart at 35, Schubert at 31, and Kurt Corbain, Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, and Amy Winehouse are among the dozens of rock stars who died at the age of 27. Just think what they could have accomplished if they had lived long enough to have finished graduate school, which is meant sarcastically. We could not make, we could make the same observation regarding writing. Sylvia Plath and Emily Bronte died at 30. Stephen Crane and Percy Bushy Shelley at 29. Keats at 25. Rambeau died at 37, but stopped writing at 21, leaving Europe with the remark, true life is elsewhere to become a gun runner. <laughs> And none of them had a PhD. So uh, look at the people you admire and see if they're sitting around stupid classrooms leave, listening to aging professors at 6.30 on, a, on Tuesdays, uh, or if they're out there doing their work. In physics, George Gamow, uh, really great guy, major physicist, uh, he worked out nuclear synthesis, how stars make the heavy elements, um, put together the heavier elements. And he wrote, wrote a few books. 
um, 1 to 3 infinity is still readable today. In physics, George Gamow observes that Newton came up with his law of gravity at 23, Einstein with his theory of relativity at 26, and Niels Bohr his theory of the atom at 27. Gamma added that he published his work on the transformations of the atomic nucleus at 24. Today's physicists would not have completed their PhDs at such age and are not permitted to make such contributions. And today, physics is a group effort. Fundamental breakthroughs, paradigm shifts that destroy old approaches and introduce new ones by individuals are no longer welcome. They are too threatening to established physics. So we've set it up to make sure that nobody does anything. You know, you just uh, absorb the BS, get your PhD, make your professors happy, get your postdoc grants, get a faculty position, don't rock the boat. I have a colleague uh, in architecture here, he was here, who gives his students three genes. I showed you that, uh, <coughs> DNA. And by the end of the semester, the building has grown itself. He's not here anymore. <laughs> Didn't get tenure. Uh, you know, too radical. We don't, we don't want stuff that's too radical. We want stuff that we can claim is imaginative, but not too rocking the boat. Now what am I going to talk about? Tech entrepreneurs, and of course, you know, Bill Gates, right? Well, it's a long list. It may have been an intuitive sense that the longer one stays in college and delays entering the fray, the less successful one will be. That led many tech entrepreneurs, most famously Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Larry Ellis, Michael Dell, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jack Dorsey, founders of Microsoft, Apple, Oracle, Dell, Facebook, and Twitter to drop out of college, and Sergey Brin and Larry Page, founders of Google, to drop out of graduate school. More recently, David Carr, founder of the social networking site Tumblr, whom we looked at earlier, didn't drop out of college, as he didn't even go to college. He didn't even finish high school, having dropped out of prestigious Bronx science. His mother saw how bored he was with school and how absorbed he was at night in front of his computer. Seeing that his passion was computers, she encouraged him to drop out of school. And then he sold Tumble for a billion dollars. In an earlier generation, Edwin Land, developer of the Polaroid Instant Camera, dropped out of Harvard and would sneak into laboratories at Columbia University at night to do his research. Michael Ellsberg, author of the Education of Millionaires writes, if a, young if a young person happens to retain enough creativity to start a business upon graduation, she does so in spite of her schooling, not because of it. Perhaps they were all motivated by the spirit of Alexander, who led armies at the age of 16 and who modeled his life on that of Achilles. Steve Jobs remarked, none of us has any idea how long we're going to be here nor do I, but, I, but my feeling is I've got to accomplish a lot of things while I'm young. <clears throat> good, I, good thing, because he didn't live very long. It's not necessarily that schools are teaching the wrong things, but that they crowd out the opportunity for something else, actually doing what one aspires to do. Who's that? Um, this is the Once and Future King by T.H. White. There's a whole bunch of whites, so I can't tell them apart. And it's the story of the young King Arthur, the edu how Merlin educated King Arthur. What does that remind you of?
young wizard. So, um, one of the key things is time alone. To think about who you are, what you want to do. I had a really great experience. I had an idea of what I was interested in, and it's how the arts manifest a culture. I said earlier, architecture is a manifestation of a culture or the crystallization of a culture in form. <clears throat> so you understand a culture, and then that's manifest in its architecture. So I was finishing up architecture school, and that's what I was interested in, more interested in that than sitting at a drafting board designing. I was interested in ideas. I said, well, OK, I got a master's in architecture, so I guess now I need a PhD. Uh, if I get a PhD in philosophy, they're going to, I'm interested in, I guess, in aesthetics. I'm going to have to take a lot of philosophy to get one course in aesthetics if I get a PhD. Maybe I could study history of art. I'm going to have to take a lot of history of art <laughs> that I'm not interested in to get a PhD in history of art. What should I do? So I go to my dean, who is a very formidable character, with these big bushy eyebrows, really intimidating people. He had put together the greatest school of the 20th century, greatest architecture school at the University of Pennsylvania. We didn't know it at the time. It was just starting to become apparent. And I said to him what I just said. I said, what would you recommend? And he said, you seem to have a clear idea what you want to do. Register for architecture 999 six times. Go to New York, write your thesis, mail it to me, and I'll give you a master's degree. I walked out of his office six inches off the ground. He was like, whoa. Um, and then I had a year to just sit there and think, now this makes sense and this makes sense. It's a totally different. What do they have in common that they both make sense? And I sort of just worked through, it's all in the book. <laughs> you know. How do you tie together Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West with Marshall McLuhan's understanding media with, you know, et cetera? And that's what I did. J.K. Rowling went to the Elephant House, packed our baby next to her, and just sat there all day writing. And she was on welfare. She taught English at night um, and worked on her book in the daytime. Who's this? Isaac Newton. So at 24, he had to get out of London because of the plague. Everybody who could afford to left. Went to the small town where he grew up. Nobody was allowed in or out because he didn't want someone with the plague coming in. He didn't want to go out and get the plague for two years. And he did optics, gravity, and laws of motion at 24. Because he was left alone for two years. <laughs> they could do his work. Who's this? A young Einstein before the curly hair. He worked in the patent office. And he just reviewed patents. It took him it was eight hours a day. He did the work in about an hour, and then the seven remaining hours, he worked on his papers. And then he was really smart, so he offered him a promotion to be manager. He said, hell no. <laughs> I'm happy here. <laughs> he couldn't get a teaching job. And um, his academic credentials were not good enough. Um, they were okay, but they weren't great. And um, in one year, 1905, he wrote five papers that just changed the world. He identified that atoms are real. That had not been established before. Did 
special relativity. He did the electromagnetic effect, which is lasers. <laughs> he did, he did five, five, five totally revolutionary papers in one year. Um, and the key in all these cases are they... So Nietzsche left out one step that I would add, and that is spend two years alone. <laughs> spend two years having six hours a day just to think about work on... Now, I didn't just sit there and think. You know, I was off to the library, I was getting books, they were piled up. I said, well, what's that about? And I go find a book and read it. I got to understand how special relativity comes from um, Lorentz transformations. I spent like a week on that. Yeah. Well, like when I was reading the parable, 